research statistician uh, at SAS Institute. Uh, today I would like to talk about stack ensemble models and how they are used in data science competitions. Uh, how many are you uh, heard of data science competitions? Uh, just curious. Yeah, good. Um, I will talk about what they are and uh, how they are used in uh, how they use stack ensemble models. This was a collaborative work with two of my colleagues, uh, Ross Wolfinger and Pei. They are both from SAS. Among us, Ross was the one who had a lot of experience with Kaggle competitions. He actually holds a master's status. Only a few people have that um, status, so it's, it's very impressive. Um, so, um, uh, I will talk about what are ensemble models and specifically what the stack ensemble models are. And then we will talk about some common problems in building predictive models uh, like overfitting, information leakage, and how we can avoid them by using some uh, techniques that best practitioners always use like cross-validation, regularization, and begging. Um, and in the second part of my talk, I will uh, talk about SAS visual data mining and machine learning, uh, show you some examples. Um, an example that we uh, built uh, to build a, a stack ensemble model, it's, it's going to be a tree level stack ensemble model. Um, so let's start with defining ensemble modeling. Uh, ensemble models are commonly used to boost prediction accuracy by combining predictions from multiple machine learning algorithms. Um, the traditional way to do it is so-called combining weak learners, but the, uh, the modern way is to do uh, first create a, a strong, well-chosen library of models and then combine them. So strong yet diverse models to have that in the model library, that's the goal. Uh, so that has many parallels in building successful human teams uh, in business and sports. Every team member makes a significant contribution and the weaknesses and biases of the other uh, contributors are offset by the, uh, uh, by the different team members. And the simplest kind of ensemble modeling is the weighted average. Suppose you have three predictive model, like you see here, one is coming from a decision tree, another coming from a support vector machine, and the last one is a neural network model. In a simple weighted ensemble, all those models take the same weight. So if you have a target, which is interval, this entails to dividing the predictions that comes from three of those models by three. Um, but more generally, you can uh, think about Using weighted average, you might believe that some of those models are stronger than others, and you might go ahead and manually give higher weights to those models. But probably the best approach here is to estimate those weights by using another level of learning algorithm, and this is called stack ensemble modeling. Uh, before I go and talk more about stack ensemble modeling, I would like to show you some examples where ensemble modeling is used. Uh, in decision trees, it's commonly used in the random forest model and the gradient boosted uh, gradient boosting model. In a random forest model, a diverse set of uh, decision trees are built on different training sets, where each training set is uh, generated by bootstrap sampling, which is simply simply sampling with replacement from the training set, but only using two thirds of the training set. And in the gradient boosting trees, um, the models are, decision tree models are successively built on, the, uh, on optimizing the residuals that comes from the previous model. And this is a kind of uh, stochastic gradient descent. In a broad sense, you can even think that multiple linear regression is an ensemble model. Uh, where the, each predictions come from a simple linear regression and the weights are formed by linear regression. So going back to model stacking, uh, so you have three predictions coming from three models and these are used as input in a second level modeling algorithm. The second level 
So, I'm sorry, second level modeling algorithm is optimally trained to minimize the loss function and produce a new set of predictions. Uh, commonly, as a second level algorithm, li linear regression models or logistic regression models are used, but this second level algorithm is not only restricted to regression. You can use any kind of machine learning algorithm which opens the door to uh, uh, other nonlinear uh, ML algorithms. So you might have noticed that ensemble modeling and model stacking are especially popular in data science, com data science competitions, um, in which a sponsor hosts a training data that includes labels and a test data that doesn't include labels. And there is this competition uh, to produce best predictions on the test set. Uh, uh, often individual teams, they build their own ensemble models and towards the end of the competitions, teams get together, they join forces to build even stronger models. Uh, one, popular, uh, one popular data science competition is Kaggle. Uh, you can explore numerous winning solutions by going to their website and just uh, look for winning solutions for different competitions to get the state uh, of the flavor of the state of the art. Another one is KDD Cup. Uh, I looked for KDD Cups this year uh, uh, competition, and it is about traffic congestion in China. Uh, I wanted to see what they use. The competition took place, um, I think, somewhere from February to June. I wanted to see how they use ensemble modeling, but I couldn't get much information because it was all in Chinese. <laughs> uh, it was hosted by the Alibaba group, so I will definitely ask one of my Chinese friends to help me understand <laughs> uh, what techniques they use there. Uh, but this is the result from 2015 KDD Cup. And they use three level stack ensemble modeling. Uh, okay. uh, in the, so this is their model library. They build a diverse set of models, 64 models, by using gradient boosting. The green boxes show the gradient boosting models. The, these are the neural network models. The uh, orange rounds are factorization machine models and regression models and so on. So <laughs> at this stage, uh, they build all those different models and you can see that there are multiple gradient boosting models. They probably differ in their use of hyperparameter settings, the number of feature sets, even the training sets. So the goal is to create as diverse as possible to be able to produce models that generalize well to a, new uh, data set. And at stage one, those 16, uh, the predictions that comes from those 64 models are used as inputs to generate 15 different new predictions that comes from these 15 models. And among those, like you see that seven are uh, gradient boosting models. And the popular XGBoost algorithm is used that. It's very, um, and we have a similar impl implementation of that in SAS. I will show an example of that soon. So this was stage one, and you have like 15 predictions coming from stage one, and they are used as input in a stage two, two stage two model here, which are gradient boosting and linear regression model, or logistic regression model. And then these two uh, predictions are combined in a single model with the regression model. Gotcha. Oh, what's the intuition, or why is there so many uh, gradient boosted models and so few? Because they are so powerful. <laughs> they were really good. Uh, they were uh, like the winning solution for many of the supervised uh, algorithms uh, that people use. And you can, I will talk about how you can get different models. Uh, by how you can enhance diversity in the next slide. So they're not all the same models. It's like you, you see here, there are like seven different feature sets and they use different hyperparameter settings, different, even input variables. They don't, those models, they are not using the same input variables. So the goal here is to create as much as diversity so that, you know, the model that we train would not, uh, 
overfit our training data. And I will talk more about that in this slide. So to build a powerful predictive model like this, the diversity is the, uh, is the key. And there are various ways to uh, enhance this diversity using different machine learning algorithms. For example, if we have like decision tree models like gradient boosted, boosted models or forest model, it's always a good idea to put a factorization model there because it's trained in a different way. Um, and also different machine learning algorithms has different strengths. And you can also, within the same algorithm, you can set different hyperparameter settings because they have like multiple local optimums. Um, and you can use different feature sets. One simple techniques that I use, just simple random sampling on the feature sets, like 50% of it, even less. Uh, but uh, also, uh, you can do this in a more principled way, like Raymond told at the first uh, before me and opening the door to this uh, hard and difficult problem of feature selection. You can also try different training sets. Uh, so you may ask, like, how am I going to try different training sets? I just have one. Um, so one is begging. Begging is something with replacements from the training set. And it doesn't use all of the observations in the set. And the other one is cross-validation. And I will talk more about that in the coming slides. So again, the reason that we had all those models uh, in the KDD and when we fit a model to uh, has as diverse models as possible um, to minimize overfitting. So in an overfitting model, if you fit an overfit model to this data, it would look something like this. So we, we don't want to do that because it won't generalize well to a new data set. Right? So we want to have more smoother curves. So these are the same data, the black points are same in and both graphs. We want to have more smoother curl just like this so it will do uh, produce a better prediction error on a new data set. And other than uh, using different models, a best practice to control overfitting is to assess your models by using cross validation. And on the next slide I will talk more about that, but before, the classical way to minimize overset, uh, overfitting is to use a single validation set. It is a reliable method to assess <coughs> models, especially if this is your final model. And this has been the main technique we use in our SAS data mining product, SAS Enterprise Miner, uh, since its inception. Uh, but. Um, but it has some disadvantages. If you are actually planning to use validation set in the model uh, training stage, the the biggest disadvantage for me uh, is that like when you build a model, it's not that you just need one validation set. You start your data set, do you, you do feature extraction, feature selection, you do model training. So how many validation sets you will have? Four or five? And every time you get a different validation set, you're decreasing your training set. So if you want to build a competitive model um, that is highly predictive, you don't want to set aside your data set and reduce your training set this much. The other one is uh, in a single, uh, when you have a single validation set, you have just one single split. Suppose you are using 30% of your data as a validation set and you're doing feature selection. So when you change the split, you might come up with a whole different set of predicted uh, variables or inputs. Um, and also uh, setting aside a one validation set does not help directly in constructing uh, stack ensemble models. So like to build stack ensemble models, remember I had predictions that are coming from each model. And for that, we will use cross-validated predictions. So uh, let's talk about cross-validation. In cross-validation, um, when I talk cross-validation, I talk about k-fold cross-validation. You divide your data into k disjoint folds, and then you uh, hold out one fold of the data and train the model on the remaining part, and you assess your model on this uh, holdout part. 
And then you do this for the second holdout part, and this is the predictions for the second holdout, uh, predictions for the third holdout set, and so on. So when you combine those predictions that come from all of the holdout sets, you will get one column of predictions that is for your whole training set. And this is, uh, these are called cross-validated predictions. Now you can use those cross-validated predictions to assess your model, and it is uh, a very good assessment compared to a single split assessment. And also you can safely use those cross-validated predictions as new input variables when you build a stock ensemble model. So I often get the question, like, how many folds do I have uh, when I do cross-validation? Five and ten are commonly used, uh, number of folds, uh, but there is no clear answer. It depends on your data size and your um, how strong signals you have in your data. Uh, but remember, every time you increase your fold number, the computational expense is increasing too. Because instead of fitting just one model and scoring for one model, you're doing it k times every time you do it. So Rayvan told a little about the collinearity problem between the pre pre uh, predictions, how ML algorithms, uh, like in general, algorithms are not good at with dealing with collinearity. And it is even a bigger problem in stock model stacking because all those predictors that you use uh, that comes from, they, they, uh, they predict the same target. So like from that level one, they all predict the same target. So they will all be highly co uh, correlated to each other. And this makes the uh, overfitting problem even worse in model stacking. And a, a good practice, arguably, uh, to use regularization when you training your stack ensemble model. Uh, these are some commonly used regularization techniques. And here, your loss function. Uh, this is for linear regression. You uh, try to minimize uh, least score errors with subject to this penalty. This is the regularization. And this kind of controls your model weights. Uh, so these are different penalties, like L2 norm of the penalties. This is especially good if you have a lot of collinearity. Lasso penalty is very good. If you want to fit your model and at the same time do some feature selection to get some interpretable models. Adaptive lasso is very good with very sparse models. And elastic nets is good at identifying group of uh, uh, correlated predictors at the same time provides the prediction too. So another um, related problem to overfitting is information leakage. I see this more and more happening in data science competitions these days. Uh, in data leakage, the information from the target somehow makes its way to a model building process. Uh, and it causes overly optimistic models, and it can be caused by human or mechanical error, but often the models uh, built it this way are useless in real life. So it's sometimes intentional, sometimes in unintentional, unintentional. One concrete example uh, to information leakage is uh, this prostate data example. And in thousands of variables in the training data, there was a variable called pro-surge. And, and the target is here if the, pro, if the patient had a prostate cancer or not. So this variable actually uh, is if they had a surgery or not. So if you build the model by using this variable, it's gonna be highly predictive. It's gonna look overly optimistic. But in real life, of course, you won't have that information to predict that if a patient has prostate cancer or not. In many instances, leakage not uh, occur in a subtle and hard to detect ways. And some types of leakage often happens in the feature engineering stage. So that is the stage that you really need to be careful because it's very easy to 
uh, make a mistake that leak the test data into the training process. So the one good practice is that if you have a test set that you want to use to assess your models, go ahead and just delete those labels for the test set until you're completely done with your, um, with your analysis to assess it in the last stage. Uh, now let's switch gears to SAS visual data mining and machine learning. So uh, SAS visual data mining and machine learning on SAS via offering uh, surfaces in memory, in memory parallel computing uh, machine learning techniques such as gradient boosting, forest, decision trees, neural networks, regression, super vector machine, and factorization machine. So all those models has different um, strengths. Um, gradient boosting models are really popular out of box solution. Uh, neural network models are really good with analyzing image data. Uh, regression is very good in ensembling and model stacking. And FACMAC is powerful for sparse data and useful for recommendation systems. Actually, this uh, factorization machine model itself was the uh, winning solution for the 2012 uh, KDD Cup, just itself, without ensembling with other methods. Um, so what each of those modeling algorithms comes with a set of hyperparameters that you need to uh, specify before you start uh, to train your model. And these are called hyperparameters because they are not optimized during the training stage. For example, if you are fitting a neural network model, uh, and uh, this is not a like, fine tuning, like if you're doing a, a neural network model from scratch, you really need to decide the architecture of that your model, how many la uh, layers it will have, how many neurons on each level and such. Also, you need to decide the stochastic gradient descent parameters, what, such as like learning rate, annealing rate, uh, and if you have regularization, what would be the regularization parameters? These are all data dependent. Even you have a lot of experience building models, you won't know what value will be good for a regularization parameter or, uh, or a learning rate. So in order to navigate this model space and active nearly optimal models, uh, a basic strategy is to fit models on a grid of those uh, hyperparameters, which would give you an infinitely many <laughs> models. Um, and it is very hard, time consuming. Uh, so one of the things we, had, uh, we have in SAS data mining and machine learning is that we have this auto tuning capability embedded in our uh, machine learning algorithms that search for those best hyperparameter tuning, uh, best hyperparameter values for all those parameters um, in using different methods. One of them is just a random search like giving you random numbers to all those uh, uh, parameters. And it is shown in true scientific papers that it is very efficient. But we have also more intelligent algorithms that use like genetic algorithms. At every iteration, it just changes the uh, parameters a little bit and refits the model and assess that by using cost validation or some other performance criteria. Uh, and we recently added Bayesian Kriging. This is also very, uh, popular uh, in hyperparameter tuning. Yeah, I think I covered everything in the slide. So using those uh, uh, techniques can re rapidly reduce the model error that's produced by default. Uh, and the great thing is that we can handle this kind of work in our in-memory parallel computing environment. So it, it can it is really fast. So next I would like to show you an example to building a strong library of diverse models and uh, and how we uh, fit a three level stack ensemble model. So for this I use one of those UCI repository data sets. I had a binary target and 13 variables, a mix of nominal, nominal and interval variables. And 
you can reach the whole project and the analysis of the data, everything is available in our GitHub repository. So I'm not gonna talk about this much, but I just um, want to mention uh, about feature engineering. So one of the things we had done with our, we did a lot of data prep, I'm not gonna go into any of the details, but uh, this for the feature engineering, uh, so I feel like feature engineering is part of the data science that is more of an art than science. And I feel like there is no black, it's not black or white, there is no like really true answer to this. Uh, it is just to use the data. Uh, it can sometimes be even an external information to uh, help you get a better prediction accuracy. Uh, so commonly used feature engineering techniques include like transformation of numeric variables, uh, like log, square, trans square transformation, uh, sometimes converting nominal variables to interval variables, sometimes converting interval variables to nominal variables. Um, and this uh, was a little hard for me to understand because I have a statistics background, like why do you invert a numerical variable to a nominal variable because you lose information, right? The number says more. But it is especially useful if you have some outliers in the data. So it just puts them in one category. Uh, also, it is known to be really useful in risk analysis. You can do many other things uh, with the feature engineering. You can generate a new variable that is actually the rankings of those your numerical variables. Possibilities are infinite. So for this data set, because I am a statistician, I uh, thought about using a one-way ANOVA on one of those numeric variables. The numeric variable is a relationship. It has like six levels, husband, not in a family, and so on. Uh, so these are the frequencies for each level and how much of the data uh, for each level. What I did is that I just fit a one-way ANOVA to, by using the training target for this variable. And then I obtained those uh, expected mean values for each level. So it actually shows that if you are in a relationship or a family, you tend to make more money than uh, if you are not. Uh, so those numbers are, so instead of using these labels in my data, which really means anything, I decided to use those numbers. So every time I saw husband, I replaced this with this number. Every time I saw a, not in a family, I so this is a numeric variable. Um, and it actually uh, helped uh, boosting the prediction accuracy. Uh, so this is the three-level stack ensemble approach we took. We wanted to build a really fancy model because we were writing a paper. <laughs> so we fit like thousands and thousands of models. So it required a lot of uh, bookkeeping of those models. So it was a challenge, but I felt like we learned a lot from this project. Um, so uh, in the level one, we have uh, we have four different modeling algorithms, gradient boosting, forest logistic, and the factorization machine model. So in this level one, we just did go, and for each of the model algorithm, we found the best set of hyperparameters by using this, um, our awesome auto-tuning capability in SAS. And then in the level two, uh, we had here, um, after we found those uh, hyperparameters, we wanted to increase the diversity, so we generated 100 uh, versions of the training set by using bootstrap sampling. And for each of the bootstrap sample, we fit the model with these uh, hyperparameter settings that we found in the first level. And same for forest logistic and factorization machine models. So we have around here four models, or 400 models. Uh, while we are doing that, we also calculated five-fold cross-validation, uh, predicted cross-validation uh, out of four predictions. So it is 400 times five. It is uh, 2,000 models at this stage. And then, um, 
So like each of the five-fold cross-validation gives just one uh, column of predicted values. So in this case here, uh, I just combine those hundred models by using equal weights, just as a simple ensemble model to create just one average ensemble model for gradient boosting, one average ensemble model for forest, logistic and factorization machine. So I haven't done stacking yet. All I did here is that I uh, generate different versions of training sets and then combine them by using a simple equal weight ensemble. But now I have this out of fault predictions from each of those uh, predict uh, ML algorithm coming. Those four of them, I, I will use to build stack ensemble model based on those four models. And for this, I will use different techniques. I will use regularize, regularized regressions. This is simply regression with like L1 or L2 norm. I will try uh, regularized scalable gradient boosting. And another technique is hill climbing. This is more discrete method. I'm not going to go into detail, but if you're interested, and I can show you some references, it's very efficient in building ensemble models too. Uh, so, so these are uh, my uh, level two ensemble model results. So these are the uh, five-fold cross-validation errors of the uh, four average models that uh, I got in the end of level two. As you can see, great interesting is, again, by no surprise, the winning algorithm here, too. It's just the error is less than. But it doesn't mean that uh, you know, uh, I can still reduce this error by using these models, because that's what I will exactly do. I will combine all those models and try to get a model, maybe somewhere er errors around here. Finish uh, real quickly. Um, so this is uh, I'm combining those four uh, predictions by using adaptive lasso. Ravan mentioned this. Uh, so you put some penalty on the uh, when you do minimize this loss function, and it is on the uh, controls the weights and controls the collinearity. And here uh, we have this rec select procedure. The, in SAS, we have a lot of procedures that are uh, kind of like wrappers on different functions, uh, like CAS functions that we have. Um, and you have a model statement that defines your target, and these are my input variables here. And I'm using lasso selection, I'm using some different criteria, I choose a different model. So the result of this model is here. So these are the different weights that each model gets. So mean gradient boosting model, of course, got the biggest weight because that was the most predictive model. But also factorization machine model and force model have to helped a little bit to uh, get a better prediction error than the gradient boosting model did. Um, so, and the other method is to use uh, this, uh, uh, to restrict the model weights in a linear regression to be positive. And this is shown to be very efficient in stack uh, ensemble modeling too. Uh, you base, uh, for this, I use the, another procedure. Actually, this is from our econometrics uh, product in SAS. And it restricts each of the coefficients here to be greater than zero. And then the results are very similar to adaptive lasso, but you see that here, logistic regression model gets a really, really small weight. It didn't appear in lasso model because lasso was also doing variable selection, so it completely eliminate that from the model, but this model doesn't have the ability to give like exactly zero to regression coefficients, so it just appeared here, but it doesn't play a big role. Uh, so the gradient boosting, procedure is our implementation of XGBoost. It's very compu uh, comparable, only um, there is slight differences. The results are very similar with XGBoost. Um, and here I'm using the auto-tuning capability to uh, find the best hyperparameter values of the gradient boosting algorithm. So all I need to do is just to add this auto-tune statement here and then uh, specify for which parameters I would like to uh, optimize. And, and for this technique, I just use the random, uh, random sampling technique, sample size is 200. So it just 
finds 200 different uh, parameter settings and then fits the model for each of them and picks the one that for which the, uh, the prediction error is the smallest. And for doing that, it compares those models by using five-fold uh, average score error, which is uh, mean score error, basically. Uh, and then I'm saving my model here, uh, I'm gonna show this later, uh, in a CAS table. So this is also in memory. That's one of the uh, great things about like having this CAS environment. Everything is in memory, so you don't really need to move data, transfer data, and it just enables you to get a lot of uh, efficiency and performance uh, when you fit uh, many models. Um, so this is the auto tuning results. Uh, you can see the best configurations, the number of trees, migrating fitting model used, the lasso parameter, rich parameter, and everything. Uh, so it shows that what the default objective value was and how, what the best objective value. So it just it decreased. And I would like to point out here how much time this took to fit this model. So you might think that I just fit one model here, but I actually fit 1,000 models. So I search for 200 uh, different uh, uh, hyperparameter settings by using five-fold cross-validation. So it's mean 200 times 5,000 different models are fit and scored in 300 seconds. This means like fitting and scoring one model is a fraction of a second, so it's very fast. Um, so in the gradient boosting model, we don't have the model coefficients like you have in a regression model, but we have this variable importance table. This kind of table can be also used uh, for feature uh, selection too. But in this case, again, my gradient boosting model, the, the most powerful model, it's getting the biggest weight, and the logistic regression, FACMAC has a small contribution, but they are helping me to uh, get a better predictive accuracy. Um, so now in this here, I'm using the grad boost statement and, and reading the saved model information in a CAS table and scoring for a new data set. So like one good practice that I learned throughout this project is that uh, when you do stock ensemble models, you're fitting a lot of models, it has different levels. One good practice is that as soon as you fit a model, just go ahead and score it for your test data set because dealing with like thousands of data, it really gets uh, hard to bookkeeping all of them. So these are the uh, predictions that I fit to models uh, that are, were the results of my level two models. So I need to use those, like this is not the original test set. This is the predictions for my test set that are for level two. That is the input and I'm scoring for that uh, using this stack ensemble state model. Um. So now this is comparing the best model from each level. You can see that the test error at each level is dropping. But if you just look at the numbers, you might say, like, does it really work to try that much? You know, that the test score is, it may not be like that significant for you to give all that effort to try all those stuff, especially going from level two to level three. But as I say, this can make a huge difference. One more minute and I'll finish. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> so it is just because we, uh, this can make a big difference in a data science competition, maybe in a, not in a business setting, but also, uh, we really wanted to build a fancy model, as I said. Like, if we just did use the level one and do simple stacking, you won't, you will get something close to this. Not this, but something close to uh, an error that you would get on the level two. So don't try too hard. Just use a simple stacking model and you would, uh, using those uh, diversity tools that I provided, and you will probably get much better model than uh, the best model. Uh, that you had in your model library. So yeah, this is my last slide. We have a paper about this, and we have a GitHub repository. 
that has all the data sets and analysis, and, and you can also reach online documentation of SAS via uh, at this link. Thank you, sorry that it took longer time. <laughs>